Hello and welcome to the programme where you can help solve crime. As always, what you see tonight will be for real. Real witnesses reconstructing real crimes in the hope that you'll spot something or someone that you've seen before. If you do, the detectives behind me are waiting for your call. Here's the number in the studio, 01811 8055. We'll give you local numbers as we go on. Your calls will, of course, be treated in confidence, and if you prefer not to speak to a police officer, you can talk to a BBC researcher. And do be ready to write things down in case you do see something you recognise. Which, in fact, you might. Last month, well over 2,000 people called, and once again we can report some positive results. For example, last month we reconstructed an armed robbery at Church House Antiques in Weybridge, Surrey. Wallace and Mary Foster were attacked in their own home, and Mr Foster was shot three times. 300 viewers called us, including criminals who were disgusted by what happened, police officers from elsewhere in the country, and people who'd simply recognised things that they'd not previously connected with the crime. As a result, Surrey Police have now arrested four people. One man has been charged with attempted murder and with robbery, one with robbery, and two women with conspiracy to commit robbery. As for Mr Foster, he still has a bullet lodged in his spine, which is causing him some pain, and he's awaiting an operation to remove it. Our appeal for information about the disappearance of Mark Tildesley produced the largest number of calls we've ever had. If you remember, Mark disappeared from a fair at Wokingham in June last year. 750 people rang with so much information that the police have put 30 more officers on the case. They have already had two new sightings of the man Mark was with, so we'll let you know what happens. And Lothian and Borders Police are still receiving information about the dramatic robbery in Edinburgh. The security van, which was robbed, chased and almost caught the getaway car. A viewer gave an important new lead on that blue Cortina. He saw it in the Livingston area on the morning of the raid. And Edinburgh police would like the man who's rung on two occasions asking for Sergeant Brown to ring him again now on Edinburgh 311 3131. That's 031, the code for Edinburgh, 311 3131. And Thames Valley Police wanted to interview a man in connection with an engineering deal, if you remember. Over £160,000 in cash had simply disappeared. Well, during the programme, we had information that the man was right then imbued in Cornwall. But before police could get there, he disappeared. Two days later, in the vill fishing village of Polruan, another viewer saw him in the Lugger pub. Finally, on the Sunday, at the Quayside guest house, locals managed to keep him talking until the police arrived. The man has now been charged with theft of cash. And a viewer in Devon has turned up some of the chairs that were stolen from the other end of the country, from Edinburgh, the district council. The viewer, an antique dealer, realised he'd bought a dozen of the chairs. They're now safely under lock and key in the police station at Barnstable, where the jailer, Mr Bush, is obviously taking no chances. If you've seen any of the remaining 52 chairs, we'll be waiting for your call. Now, before our first reconstruction tonight, an urgent appeal. As part of their recent major inquiry, the anti-terrorist branch need to identify these three keys. One of them, a mortise-type key, has M200M embossed on it, and the well-used Yale with the plastic cover has the letters KIS printed on one side. Now, all three have been tied together with brown string. If there's any way that you think you can identify these keys, then an officer from the anti-terrorist branch is waiting to take your call. You can ring them here or you can ring them direct on 01230 1212. That's London 230 1212. We're told that this is extremely important. Our first reconstruction this month is about a murder. Jackie Waynes was 35, the mother of three children. Her husband had deserted her and the children had been taken into care. Jackie was a prostitute, working on the streets of Bristol. She was murdered on the evening of the 20th of April. It was a bitterly cold Saturday night, a time which locals might remember because there were a lot of visitors in the area for the last day of the badminton horse trials. Our reconstruction starts in St Paul's, near Bristol city centre. Jackie worked the streets of St Paul's where everyone, it seems, knew her. But she was a loner. She only had one real friend, Avril Miles, with whom she shared a house. As far as I'm concerned, she was more a sister than anything else. 
She's a good kid, you know. If anybody wanted any help, she would give them. She wouldn't ask twice. But if she wanted help from them, it's a different thing altogether. They judged Jackie because um, she's dressed scruffy. She was this, she was that. But I mean, people just go by the way she was dressed. You don't judge people like that. Jackie worked that Saturday night after visiting Avril in hospital. Comes back on again, yeah, a bit nifty, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Lots of people saw her between 8 and 10 o'clock. At a quarter to 11, she walked up Brigstock Road with another girl. I got picked up last night. When they let me go, I come back out and did a 30. Mm -hmm. The red Cortina was parked on the corner of Hepburn Road, where Jackie lived. Since she got straight into the car, without negotiating first, her friend wondered if Jackie knew the man. She remembers him as having curly, blonde hair. He turned right at the top of Brigstock Road, into Ashley Road. By 10 past 11, Jackie had returned to the area, Ashley Road in the middle of St Paul's. A prostitute saw her on the other side of the street, getting into a small escort type of van. She didn't see it drive away. Ten minutes later, when she looked again, Jackie was walking the other way, up Ashley Road. It was the last time she was seen alive. At midnight, nine miles away, some young men were on their way home from a night on the town. They pulled into a track off Perrin Pit Lane, a country road near Frampton Cottrell. They weren't listening to music and smoking. They had no idea of what was to happen in the next 20 minutes. At 10 past 12, Mr and Mrs Shilson passed the end of the track where the boys were parked. Look at that chap touching rubbish. We ought to take his number and report him to the council. The van must have parked only yards behind the boys, yet they hadn't noticed it. <laughs> but at about 12.15, some time after the van had gone, they did see a dark Cortina arrive. At 20 past 12, Craig Howell and his girlfriend Julie past the same corner. They too saw the Cortina, and then they saw what looked as if it could be a body. Julie turned the car round further down the lane, but by the time they got back to the spot, the Cortina had gone. Jackie's body was found only an hour after she was last seen alive. She'd been stabbed several times. I want people to help the police to find him before he does it again. You know, you don't know who it's going to be next. A tragic end there to a sad life. Detective Superintendent Malcolm Hughes is in charge of that investigation. Is there any apparent motive that you can find so far? Well, the motive certainly isn't robbery, because when her body was found, she still had money with her. There are two possibilities, really, I think. One, that she had some sort of argument with a client of hers. Or the more sinister possibility that somebody went out with the express intention of killing a prostitute, or Jackie in particular. She didn't seem, from what I know, to have been a very argumentative sort of person. No, that, that is quite true, and it seems that the latter is the case. And 
we seem to have a very dangerous man still at large. Now you need to trace a number of people, as we saw in our reconstruction. First of all, the man in the red cortina with the curly blonde hair. Yes, we know that at about 10.45 p.m. that night, she got into a red cortina in Brigstock Road. Uh, it, all, the, all the indications are that she may have known this man. He's a man with blonde hair, fair hair, which was curly and may have been highlighted. And they drove off into Ashley Road. Now, if she did know that man, she may have had some conversation and told him of her, of her intentions that night, which, of course, would be important to so us. So you'd like him to come forward. You'd also like the man who was seen there in the escort type of van. We don't know exactly what sort of van it was or even what colour it was, but we need the man who was driving that van to come forward. Yes, at about ten past eleven in Ashley Road, she was seen to get into an, a, a van, which is the same si size as an escort van, but uh, we don't know the colour of it. That man is important, but he, he appears to be the last man that we know that spoke to her. Right, if we can just get the geography straight of the area. To, Jackie's body was actually found there at Frampton Cottrell, which is a small village about nine miles north of the centre of Bristol. How long would it have taken, in fact, to drive there on the M32? It takes about 15 minutes, in fact. But, of course, Jackie could have mur been murdered anywhere between St Paul's and the spot where her body was found and taken there and dumped. Right. Well, it was in Perrinpit Lane where she was found, and there's a bridle path, which we're going to see in a minute, um, which is where those two boys were parked, those boys were parked listening to music. There it is, and was, there's the track where they were listening to the music. And her body was dumped just about ten yards behind their car at the start of that bridle path, is that right? Yes, that's right. Now what about the white van that was seen in that lane, Perrin Pit Lane, by the couple passing by? Yes, I believe this is probably the most important sighting of the lot. Uh, Mr and Mrs Shilston drove past her at about ten past twelve on the Sunday morning. They saw the white van and standing beside it they saw a man who's described as slim build, uh, wearing blue jeans and a multicoloured bomber jacket, similar in every respect to this one. It's not an entirely uncommon jacket, but... No, indeed it's not. They're, they're quite popular. But we know that that man was wearing that type of jacket. Now, at his feet, he had a white bundle, a large white bundle, they described it as. And uh, I believe that that was the body of Jacqueline Waynes. The van itself is white, it's rather larger than a transit type van and more importantly it had on the offside uh, some damage it looked like an impact mark and some scratches as you can see there now we would uh, obviously want to locate that vehicle and certainly we want to locate a man who wore a jacket like this who would have access to a vehicle like that and it's just possible that somebody may have patched up that damage on the offside of that van yes indeed uh, if anybody knows of a vehicle which has had that sort of damage repaired and of course we would want to talk to them. Of course and also the man driving the dark coloured Mark 4 or Mark 5 Cortina that we saw there. Yes that's intriguing he hasn't come forward I believe he must have seen something and it's very important that I see him and I'm quite prepared to see him anywhere and in complete confidence. Now you've never found one of her shoes that might provide a clue if you can find the other one of her shoes. Yes that's true. Uh, Jackie was wearing a pair of shoes and this is the right one the left one is missing despite quite an extensive search we haven't found it if anybody has found or knows the location of a sandal like that, then of course we would want to speak to them. And all these people you'd like to come <coughs> forward, and this is an absolute confidence, of course, isn't it? Yes, indeed. The, the, I'm not in, interested on why those people were down in St Paul's, if they were looking for the services of a prostitute. That doesn't worry me. I need their help. And I would want them to come forward and talk to me tonight in confidence. To prevent another tragic murder like that? Yes, indeed. Thank you very much indeed. If you can help, please do ring us. It is in absolute confidence. You can speak to a BBC researcher if you prefer. The number 01811 or you can call Avon and Somerset Police at Bristol, 565-333. That's 0272, the code for Bristol, 565-333. And now with the Crime Watch Incident Desk, here are Constable Helen Phelps and Superintendent David Hatcher. We start the incident desk with the murder of William Austin last Saturday night. He was shot during a raid by three masked men at the home of Mrs Ellen Ditcher near Maidstone in Kent. Mrs Ditcher, who's 74, was also shot and is still in hospital. One of the men fired a crossbow and that may be how you can help solve this appalling crime. A six inch crossbow bolt was found at the scene. These are usually fired from a small handheld bow. But Mrs Ditcher remembers a larger bow, something like this. But the limbs that's this bit, appeared wooden and ornately decorated. If you've seen anybody with one of these recently, or if you've had one stolen, ring us now so we can find these men as soon as possible. North Yorkshire Police urgently need your help to track down a rapist. 
His most recent attack was on Wednesday the 12th of June on the York University campus. It happened just after midnight near this lane. It's a route many students use as a shortcut. A man was seen riding a red moped slowly down the lane. He was wearing a dark leather jacket and a light-coloured crash helmet. He parked his moped halfway down the lane. Now, we are anxious for this man to ring us now and eliminate himself from the inquiry. They also want to trace anyone who came home late that night spattered with mud. But there was another attack, two weeks earlier in the same field. It happened on the night of Friday the 24th of May. And this is a crime watch video fit of the rapist. He was about five foot ten, well built and spoke with a Yorkshire accent. He had a weather beaten complexion and his hair was slightly receding. Officers strongly suspect that there is a connection between the two attacks and are sure that he will strike again. Remember, you can ring us now in confidence. Officers investigating a murder in Brixton need urgent assistance. Martin Daly was killed on December the 19th last year and Metropolitan Police want to trace this man in connection with his murder. He uses the name Tony and he's also believed to be a dealer in cocaine and heroin. Police are certain he's been in Liverpool in the last month. They know that he's got a friend there called Peter, another black man aged 35 who's six feet tall. Tony has hired vehicles in Liverpool and driven them south to Gatwick Airport where detectives believe he collects the drugs. Remember what he looks like because we also know he's been in Walsall in Staffordshire recently, staying there with a man called George. In fact, we know quite a lot about his movements, but we need your call to find out where he is now. On the night of May the 14th, a smoker's paradise was burgled. The House of Pipes Museum in Bramber, Sussex, has probably the largest collection of antique pipes in the world. After breaking in through the roof, the burglars opened the presentation cabinets and stole 200 of these German pipes. Collectors would recognise them easily as 19th century Meerschaum pipes. You can see from some they left behind that they're quite extraordinary. Some have heads on the balls, there are birds and animals too, all intricately carved down to the last detail. Now items like these just couldn't go unnoticed by dealers. So let us know if you've been offered any of these weird and wonderful smoking implements. Last December, two armed robbers in Oldham got away with a large Christmas bonus, nearly half a million pounds. It happened on the 20th of December as a security van drove through the Daisy Nook Country Park. A couple of hundred yards further on, the van would have passed this suitably named landmark. Police investigating the robberies suspect that the money is still being stored somewhere. It was carried in 41 ammunition boxes like this. None of them have turned up yet. They were loaded into a box van similar to this Ford D series van stolen in Manchester the night before the robbery. It too is still missing. Part of the cash was in £20 notes. These are some of the serial numbers that have been circulated to all national banks and so far none of these new notes have reappeared. A reward is being offered for information leading to conviction or recovery of the money. It's £48,000, so if you know anything, can you afford to keep quiet? Police in West London are keen to speak to two bogus callers. They're both women and have a very unusual routine. First call was Bledlow House in Lisson Green back in March. Here, an elderly man believed their story about a car breaking down. He offered them tea and the use of his telephone, but they took some of his cash and silver and made a fast exit. By May, they developed their act by dressing up as nuns armed with collecting boxes. Here in the Edgware Road, they called on a small tailoring business. One kept staff talking, whilst the other snatched an envelope containing £600. In early June, they were in Parkway in Camden Town, where they stopped for lunch at the Golden Grill restaurant. The owner found their behaviour odd, especially when he noticed one had jewellery and eye makeup. Both are in their 30s and noticeably short, about 5 foot 2. One has ginger hair and a soft Irish accent, and the other has dark hair and a London accent. They were last seen just nine days ago, joking with a man in the front of a yellow transit van, just off Oxford Street. Give us a call if you've seen them, or if you can help with any of this month's incident death cases. And again, the number to ring if you can help is 01811 That's 01811 now, until recently, criminals, as much as anyone, considered stealing from a church quite unacceptable. It seems now the reverse is true. Churches, unlocked and often full of treasure, are uniquely vulnerable to burglary. Robert Runcie, the Archbishop of Canterbury, told Crime Watch he believes that our cities and our countryside are impoverished because churches are so often closed for their protection. In fact, each year, one in every four churches is either vandalised or burgled, and over a million pounds worth of church property is stolen. There's no obvious pattern to these crimes, but it does seem that in many cases, the thieves aren't amateurs. 
In February, in Stoke-on-Trent, at St Mary's and Chad Parish Church, a ten-foot by five-foot oak crucifix was stolen. It's worth £2,000, and it was cut down and removed from where it stood outside the church. In the northeast, in May this year, St Andrew's Church in Gateshead was broken into at night. The safe was forced open with a pickaxe, and £6,500 worth of communion silver was stolen. And near Doncaster, at the beginning of April, St Catherine's Church in the tiny village of Lovesall had nearly £2,000 worth of antique furniture and brass stolen. The real mystery about these thefts is where the criminals sell the items that they steal. There has to be a market. You're about to see a reconstruction which involves two thefts, one in Gloucestershire and one in York. On the face of it, they're quite unconnected. It may prove they're more than a coincidence that the relics stolen are very similar. The story begins in Tewkesbury in Gloucestershire. Tewkesbury Abbey on a winter's afternoon. It was Monday, the 28th of January. Among the Abbey's most valuable relics is this 14th century Madonna and Child. It's valued at £34,000 and one of only two in the world. The handyman, Malcolm Isles, noticed two men in the Abbey that afternoon. They appeared to be taking a rather closer interest in the layout of the church than most tourists do. One was about five foot eight with dark hair and the other was taller with light collar length hair. Two hours later, as a parishioner arrived just before Evensong, she too saw a light-haired man entering the abbey. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. He seemed rather well-spoken. That parishioner's daughter and the abbey sacristan saw him too. He spent some minutes inspecting the cloister door. What's that chap doing behind there? Six p.m. The sacristan shut the abbey as usual. Police now know that sometime that night, a wooden bench was used by someone as a ladder to one of the windows. The burglar clearly knew what he was after. He'd got to the Madonna and Child despite the specially toughened glass. The escape was made by picking the lock on the cloister door. York, five months later, Friday the 14th of June. St Olive's Church, Marygate, is 11th century, an active place of worship and a tourist attraction. The vicar, the Reverend Alan Heslop, and a local architect arrive at half past two. The new roof of the Lady Chapel needed a final inspection. While he was up there, the architect recalls hearing the organist practicing. Around a quarter to three, the Reverend Heslock paused to listen to the bark prelude. There was one other person enjoying the music, a local visitor who also remembers admiring the alabaster Madonna and Child, an 18th century statue greatly valued by the parishioners. Just after three, Mrs Parks, one of the flower arrangers, arrived. She too recalls seeing some people in the church. 
When I came through the door, I just glanced around casually and standing with his back to me, looking right down the church, there was a man dressed in fawn clothes with a fawn bag. There were a couple of tourists about halfway down the aisle. While I was in the vestry, I was vaguely conscious all the time of people moving about as they would walking up and down on stone floors and of the noise that's made when the front door slams back shut behind someone. I finished the vase, then I carried it outside, down the side aisle. I just noticed out of the corner of my eye that there was no statue on the plinth. Between 3 and 3.30, it had been stolen. To remove a two-and-a-half-foot statue secured to a steel mounting was almost certainly a professional job. Sergeant Richard Hall, let's take the, the York robbery first, the St Olive's Church one. What do you hope to find out? Well, we hope to trace the person that was seen in there that afternoon. The York police haven't managed to trace yet. All we can say is he's dressed in fawn clothing and carrying a fawn bag. It was Friday the 14th of June. Now, people won't That's remember right. that date unless they go back in their diaries. That's when right. anybody was in St Olive's Church? Between 3 and 3.30 that afternoon, in particular. Just to call you? Yes. OK, they might have uh, some information. Now, what about the Tewkesbury one? What do you hope to find out there? Well, again, there were two people who we haven't traced that afternoon acting very suspiciously in the Abbey. They were seen by several people, parishioners. Uh, the particular one man was six foot tall. Um, he had uh, fair curly hair down to his shoulders and he's described as having his eyes wide apart. Could be foreign looking. We're anxious to trace him and a smaller man with dark hair who was seen with him, acting suspiciously in fact by the doorway where the offenders escaped. Did he have a foreign accent? Uh, he had uh, what described as a, a good accent, cultured accent. Right, OK. Now, the Madonnas themselves, if they've been sold to a dealer, what would they know about them? How would they recognise them? Well, the, the small Madonna from Tewkesbury Abbey uh, is thought to be only w uh, one of two in the world at the present time. Um, it is slightly damaged. The offender may not have known that when he stole it, because I think he stole it to order. It's got a slit in the back of the ivory running about four inches from the base. Right, and what about the York The larger one, one um, the crown on the child has been damaged in the past and has been stuck on. So it, there would be evidence that it's been repaired. Right. That's two and a half feet tall. Now, to somebody to steal this, you, you say they stole it to order. This is organised. It's definitely organised, and it's a sorry day that we've got to lock our churches and cathedrals and abbeys because there's some marvellous stuff on show. Indeed it is. Well, uh, good luck. If there's anything uh, that you can do to help, please do call us. The number here, if you think you can help, yes. 018118055. There are detectives from both inquiries in the studio. Of course, if you prefer and you want to talk in confidence, uh, you can speak to a BBC researcher. Well, now the Crime Watch photo call. There are three people police need to trace tonight. With the details, David Hatcher. Our first face is a familiar one. His real name is Sidney Noble, but you're more likely to have heard his nickname, Dr Death. In April, he went missing from an open prison where he was serving a 10-year sentence for drugging old people and then stealing their money. Since May, six similar offences have been committed from South End to Western Supermare. The man, who usually arrives by taxi, pretends to be interested in property or gardening. When he gains entry, he says he's a doctor, able to treat rheumatism. Sidney Noble is 57 and 5 foot 7. He's got tattoos on his right forearm saying Stan and Vicky and a picture of a swallow. Now make sure he doesn't fool you. He looks quite smart and is well spoken. And ring us now if you've seen him. We also need to find this man in connection with an elaborate fraud which involves conning unemployed people out of large sums of money. This advertisement has appeared in newspapers all over the country, offering skilled jobs in Indonesia, working for a company called Anglo-Dutch Overseas Development. Every applicant is offered a job and they're then asked to send £290 to the address in Rotterdam towards their airfare. But the ticket, the job and the company are all bogus. We don't know this man's name, but we do want to speak to him about this inquiry. He could be anywhere in the country. So if you've seen him or if you know his name, please call us. And Warwickshire Police want your help to find this man. Keith Alfred Hunt was the managing director of the Exchange Securities Group of Companies. The total investment in this business was £15 million. Mr Hunt disappeared from his home in Warwick in April 1983. 
He's six foot three and has light brown hair. He's also well-spoken and smokes cigars and a pipe. He may still be in Britain, but he could be abroad by now. So if you're off on holiday and you see Keith Hunt by the pool, let us know when you get back. You can't miss him. He weighs 18 stone. If you see him or any of our photo call faces, phone us now. And the number 01 811 8055. 811 8055. Our last case is an armed robbery which happened just under a month ago. At least four men, two of them armed, attacked a Securicor van in St Albans. They escaped with well over £100,000 in cash. For security reasons, we can't show some of the fine details of the robbery. But as you'll see, there are many ways in which you might be able to help. The date was Saturday the 15th of June. That was the morning the papers had their first reports of the TWA hijack, which had started the day before. Although the robbery took place in Hertfordshire, our reconstruction starts in London. Just around the corner from the busy junction at Bounds Green tube station, sometime between 10pm on Thursday the 2nd of May and 2.15 the following afternoon, a red Ford Cortina was stolen from its parking place in Oak Lane. Five weeks later, opposite Wembley Conference Centre in West London, a blue Ford Granada was stolen. Both the Cortina and the Granada had an appointment to keep two days later in St Albans. On the morning of Saturday the 15th of June, the day of the robbery, the manager of the co-op dairy in Burley Road arrived as usual at around 8 o'clock. At about 10 to 5 that afternoon, a witness remembers seeing a red Cortina pull up at the back of the dairy in Oak Dean Way. The driver hurried across the road to a blue Granada. Half an hour later, a witness remembers seeing two men walking past Alban Court towards the dairy next door. They were wearing green overalls, so he assumed them to be milkmen. He described the one sitting on the wall as being about 5 foot 10 to 6 foot tall and thick set. It looked as though he was wearing a dark brown wig or toupee. Another witness also saw the two men as she was waiting for a taxi. She had a good look at the other man. He was about 5 foot 8 tall with dark brown greying hair under his woolen ski hat and she noticed in particular that he was wearing rubber gloves. As her taxi pulled away, she glanced at the blue Granada that had been parked there for some time. The driver was in his late 30s or early 40s, was slightly balding and had a moustache. It was just after half past five that afternoon when a Securicor van drove up Burley Road towards the dairy. The driver only vaguely noticed a milkman apparently washing the manager's car as he pulled up to make his regular collection of the takings.
Chief Inspector Mick Howley, Howley is the man looking for, for the getaway. Now, they must have been seen. That was a, a noisy getaway. Where did they go? Well, they turned right um, out of Burley Road into Castle Road, right into Ashley Road, across the Hill End Hospital roundabout, into Drake's Drive, and then left into Selwyn's Lane. Were they seen on that route, as far as you know? Yes, they abandoned the Blue Granada on the car park of the Squash Club. The vehicle was seen to contain two men. It was followed at that time by a white family-sized hatchback, which we believe may be connected. Now, we know the numbers of those cars, <coughs> and you've actually got number plates from them. Yes, both the vehicles. The red Cortina bore the false index plate VSE-115X, the blue Granada A724SJD. Now, most reputable companies that make up these plates keep records. So obviously we're appealing to anybody who may have re remembered making up these plates. Right. Now, the <coughs> men involved, you've got a very good description of at least one of them. Yes, the second man, the video fit, um, is described as mid-40s, a long, chubby face, um, dark hair, approximately 15 stone, believed to be wearing a wig. So his hair might not actually be dark. That is correct. Right, and you've got a good description, not quite so good, but a good description of a, of a second man. Yes, the second man, slightly smaller. This is the one with the pistol. Probably five foot eight inches. Um, he was wearing a balaclava. He's slightly slimmer in build, um, ruddy complexion. Right. You recovered some of the bags in which the money was stolen. Tell me about that. Yes. Um, two days later, on the Monday, this cricket bag was found in the River Lee between Tottenham and Lee Bridge. We'd obviously like to hear from anybody who saw anybody disposing of a bag such as this into the River Lee, either from a bridge or the river bank, um, because they may well be connected. Right. What are these rather... <coughs> that's a rather vicious-looking thing. What's the point of that? The, 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 this very, very heavy chain and this container here, which contained ammonia, were in the bucket and obviously this ruthless gang would have used these weapons together with the firearms if things had not gone according to plan. They were prepared to squirt, am squirt ammonia in someone's face? I have no doubt about that at all. So they're obviously men who are quite prepared to use violence. Very ruthless. There is, I'm told, a reward. <clears throat> there is a very substantial reward on offer for information leading to the arrest and prosecution of these men. We hope that um, persons, close associates perhaps, um, of these suspects may come forward being attracted by the reward. OK, Inspector Howley, thank you very much. Uh, please do call us if you know anything. The number to ring, if you can help, is 01811 8055. Or you can call Hertfordshire Police at Welland Garden City. The number there, Welland Garden City 331 That's 0707 331 011. And if you haven't had the chance to write the numbers down, they're all on CFAX, if you have that, on page 186, and they're there for the rest of the week. Or you could drop us a line. Here's the address, Crime Watch UK, BBC Television Centre, London W12 HQT. Our main number here is easy to remember, and we'll be here for the rest of the evening. We've already had many calls uh, about these keys. The anti-terrorist squad is looking for them, in particular this union key marked M200M. If you recognise it, please do give us a call. We'll be back for Crime Watch update in an hour and a half from now to let you know what happened. We're very conscious that Crime Watch is sometimes frightening. Almost all of you there who write to us say that you're reassured that something is being done. Well, with your help, something is being done. So please... Don't have nightmares. Do sleep well. We'll be waiting for your call. For the moment, good, good night. night.